Mark, you may proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Callan. Um, as I begin to go over the evidence with you and to talk about these charges, I want to put a question out there. And I'm not going to answer it immediately, but my question is this. Why would Ed Apple steal a backpack? So that's a question that needs to be answered. Why would Ed Apple steal a backpack? Another question for you. Why would Ed Apple steal half a day of school time just to lose four days from that year of take time he could have taken off. I'm gonna put those questions out there. You see, the administration here is saying that Ed Apple is a hardened criminal. He's a thief, he's a liar, he's basically a perjurer, he's thwarting an investigation, obstructing an investigation. Well, if that's the case, He's one of the smartest criminals in the history of this county. You know why? Because he left behind so much evidence of his innocence. Let's go through this history. January 1, he's at Black Tuscarora with Dr. Yarger. Now, incidentally, I don't want something to be forgotten here. His testimony was that Dr. Yarger said it was fine for these items to be moved. Notice who the administration has not produced to contradict that. They didn't call Dr. Yarger to contradict that. Why? I understand why, <laughs> because for obvious reasons. There are big concerns with Dr. Garber, but that's not Mr. Apple, and what I'm here to talk about is Mr. Apple, because January 1st, if he was engaged in a criminal enterprise, and Mr. Berry and Mr. Cook showed up unexpectedly, what should have happened? Well, a thief with criminal intent would have abandoned the plan, would have lied about why they were there, Certainly wouldn't have moved things in plain sight of two people who, by all accounts, everyone agrees, showed up unexpectedly. What thief would do that? Or would threaten them and say, you better not tell anyone or it'll be your job, or something worse will happen. Did that happen? No. In fact, Mr. Cook, Mr. Barry, helped put those <coughs> tables on the pickup truck. That's not how a thief acts. A thief doesn't do things in plain view. A thief tries to cover up or abandon or run or lie or threaten. That didn't happen. So then we have, in later January, the shed, which Mr. Apple had told Mr. Condo about in 2018, his desire, I want to help the boosters. He talked to the boosters. Don't spend the money. Let's see if we can do something for you. Trying to get that shed. Those stainless steel tables go to the shed. In the January. Mission accomplished. They got into the shed. Now, there's been this question raised to be used as meat pickles. What did that mean? Well, you heard Dr. Edder, when he testified, say that his focus was overwhelmingly on Dr. Gardner. In the context where, on February 11th, an agreement was given to Mr. Apple which was here. This is the first time you're seeing it, but you got to sign it. Mr. Apple knowing that there was this broader investigation of Mr. Yarger, looking over the language, not liking it, but seeing it, and it says the intention was for them to use the meat tables. Well, that is true. That is what Dr. Yarger wanted to use them for, <coughs> but Dr. Yarger didn't use them for that, and he had no ability to use them for that because it was on locked property. That didn't happen. That was not that Apple lying. That was a statement which was made in the context of an investigation into Dr. Yarger. And yet all this is being twisted around, and he's made out to be a perjurer, someone obstructing the investigation, obstructing justice. Now, that's not the case. Because if that were the case, why, when Dr. Edder did in fact meet with him the first time on February 4th, did Ed Apple tell him all of these things? Again, that's not the way a thief acts. And in fact, he didn't even stop there. He followed it up. He sent pictures the next day. He texted pictures. So he said, well, it's not enough just for me to tell you about it. I tell you what, here are some of the things. I'm not opening it very well, but they're in your binder. Here are pictures of some things I took. Now, what thief does that? What thief also sends an email with an attachment with a list 
which is written out in formal academic style. Roman numeral one, capital A, capital B, Roman numeral two, A, B. That's not how a thief acts. And yet, this administration is bent on portraying him as someone evil and insidious. You heard the character witnesses. You heard what they said. This is not consistent with a 25-year educator. What did he suddenly develop kleptomania 25 years in? Decides to steal things, doesn't sell them, doesn't try to sell them. They're all here. And yet, he gets accused. That email that he sent even said to Dr. Edder, if you have any questions, please call. The doctor ever called? No, he didn't. Yet he was the investigator. I really couldn't understand <coughs> until I had the opportunity to question Dr. Edder on cross-examination how we possibly got to this point where there's a termination proceeding against Mr. Apple, who's been in this district for 25 years, over this situation. What, how did it get blown so out of proportion? And then I finally understood when he answered my questions, because I think, now this is my theory, I think when he saw this list that was attached to the email and made that incorrect assumption that items marked placed in storage meant Mountain View, and then found out that they weren't in Mountain View. That was the beginning of this blowing up into all kinds of accusations of lying and wrongdoing. But you heard him testify. He did not follow up, despite the fact Mr. Apple in that cover email said, please call if you have any questions. He assumed place and storage equal Mountain View. That was a wrong assumption. I'm sorry, it was wrong, but that's what led to all these further recriminations, and these actions, these accusations, that somehow Mr. Apple was covering up when he had given a list this specific. I mean, that's amazing. What the facts that way? <coughs> Let's go to the red zone. All right, so first of all, we've got this accusation that somehow there was an abuse of a petty cash fund. Well, you heard some testimony from Mr. Drago. The use of this fund goes back a very long time. And it apparently was not something significant enough that Mr. Musselman, who breezed in and breezed out of here, showing up five years after the fact to just launch criticisms against Mr. Apple, that he had any time to actually instruct anybody on, because you heard him testify he had more important things to do. But he was he had enough time to come in here and criticize. So then he left. But this practice of this fund, is it best practices? I'm not going to say it's best practices. Was it a practice? Yes, it goes back at least to Mr. Drive list. I mean, we're talking many, many, many years. And yet the administration now at this point gets on their high horse and said, you're condemned, we're going after you. It's all your fault. That's what they say. That's what they say. Well, isn't that interesting? I don't see a proceeding against the other people that have been involved in this petty cash fund. I don't see any action against Ms. Schiff. I'm not saying they should take action against Ms. Schiff. I'm saying, let's look at this reasonably, equitably. Do you fire somebody over these things? Are you gonna fire everybody who was at the lunch that day? Are you gonna fire anyone who has ever put money in or taken out of that petty cash fund? Especially when Dr. Kovac said it's not a very clearly written policy. I don't say this to criticize anyone. I'm not criticizing you. I'm not criticizing the district. What I'm pointing out is, that what's happening to Mr. Apple is not fair. All of a sudden, there's this run out of town on a rail mentality. Mr. Apple's the worst thing that ever happened in this district. Get rid of him. When he has spent 25 years in this district, and if that can happen, where a professional employee can suddenly be ditched because all of a sudden, other members of the administration decide he's gotta go, we don't like it, what can we find there? We got him, you're out. That's gonna be very bad for the future of this district because that word gets around. That word gets around. That really, you're not very secure if you're hired there. Well, let's talk about the alcohol issue. The alcohol issue. You know what's one thing the administration never put in evidence? 
any actual policy that said that somehow it was wrong to consume alcohol during school time. I don't see that. It's not in your binder. Unless I overlooked it, I didn't see it. But let me talk more broadly about it. The question is, it seems like what they're really trying to get at is they're trying to accuse him of taking half a day off, getting paid for it when he shouldn't. Now, of course, if he did take half a day off, then it's really no one's business how he chooses to eat lunch. It's no one's business how he spends those hours. So now I'm going to get to that the, the second of those two questions I asked at the beginning. Why would Ed Apple steal half a day only to finish the fiscal year with four days unused? That makes no sense. You can't get around that objectively. That makes no sense at all. Ms. Schick doesn't remember him saying it. He says he said it. He also says he put money down on the table. There's no contrary evidence. I mean, I realize you can either believe or disbelieve it. What I'm saying is they are putting one card on top of another because none of these individual allegations are enough to terminate somebody, and they know it. So they're trying to string this with that and with the other thing and somehow convince you that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Well, it's not. It's not enough. It does not meet the standard under the law, and your lawyer will instruct you on that in more detail, of course. Let me talk about one contradiction in testimony that may be on your mind. Mr. Apple testified that when he met with Dr. Edder on the 11th, Dr. Edder said, report will go to the state police if you don't sign this thing. And that he felt coerced and he signed it anyway. Dr. Edder said, no, that didn't happen. You saw with your own eyes Dr. Edder not testify fully the first time he was asked about the February 4th meeting. Remember what he said? He said, well, Mr. Apple said that there were stainless steel tables and a pot and pan. It was only when I cross-examined him, oh, yeah, there was reference to a meat slicer. Pretty interesting. Oh, I don't have perfect recall. Six months ago. Well, you know what that is, ladies and gentlemen? I'm not accusing Dr. Edder of lying. I'm accusing him of being a human being. People forget things sometimes. People don't speak in 100% scientific military accuracy at all times. But you saw with your own eyes, there is not a perfect record keeper over here in this case that's being used against Mr. Apple <coughs> when they are trying to look at the smallest little thing and say, aha, we got you there, aha, we got you there. Apparently, the use of the term abandoned to describe black Tuscarora is somehow an intentionally false statement. That's absolutely ridiculous. That building was closed. There were no more classes there. It was locked. Yet, quote unquote, abandoned is now a crime as they accused. In fact, that accusation was so outrageous, your counsel struck it. That was completely, completely outrageous that you would come in here and assert that you had criminal jurisdiction over him when you had nothing. Can you keep your volume down? I think the board would appreciate it. Let's get to possibly the most ridiculous of all. Well, Mr. Apple. You committed all these crimes against the district. The Pennsylvania State Police are after you. You were charged. We're the victim. And yet you didn't tell us that you've been charged. Oh, so now we're going to terminate him because he didn't give the district a letter containing information that the district knew in its entirety. That's why I asked Dr. Dr. Kovac, was there a single thing in that form that you're saying Mr. Apple didn't submit that the district didn't already know? Answer, no. The district knew it all. And yet again, Mr. Apple has to be portrayed as the worst person ever to be in this district. Listen, if you want to have a wine and the cheese party and you want to talk about the finer points of world diplomacy, the future of the Korean Peninsula, Brexit, monetary policy, Ed Apple is probably not the first person on your invitation list. But doggone it, if you want someone who's going to look at property that's not being used by the district and who's going to have a vision for it so that the boosters can save five or six thousand dollars and get those stainless steel tables and get that slicer and get those pots and pans and get the other tables and chairs to move into the district, Ed Apple's your guy. You have him here. Don't dismiss him. 
Don't dismiss him. This is a house of cards. It's a bunch of accusations strung together. Not one of them is sufficient. And in their entirety, they're not sufficient. The right thing to do is to vote against and to turn down this effort, let the district move forward. A lot of damage has been done here, but the district can move forward. And Ed Apple is the guy who has been there protecting the students and their interests. And I hope that you will vote to keep him in that position because that is where he is serving this district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Neff? Thank you. <coughs> um, yes, in fact, Mr. Apple has been charged with immorality. That's one of the statement of charges. But he's also been charged with willful neglect of duties and persistent and willful violation of or failure to comply with state laws of the Commonwealth, including official directives and established policy of the Board of Directors. That's in the statement of charges. That's also in the school code. Mr. Apple's defense seems to be twofold. First of all, it's not my fault. Mr. Yarger's actions of, uh, is responsible for his actions of January 1st and January 12th. But yet, now we're hearing that he stood up to Mr. Yarger whenever they were removing the tables. That doesn't make any sense. He, he suddenly became the white knight out in the woods. Didn't happen. Mr. Musselman came in and testified about the petty cash. He was at least aware of it. Mr. Apple didn't seem to have any, any inclination as to what policy 617 said, despite the fact that he was an administrator in your district before Rick Musselman ever came as superintendent. That would be something that he should know about. He also blames Sabrina Shipp for taking petty cash and not reporting them on, despite the fact that he's the leader of that building. He's the one that pretty much does everything according to his own job description. He blames Scott Etter for forcing him to sign a document that he said he didn't know anything about or that was inaccurate. He even goes, and despite the fact that Scott Etter was sent these texts with pics, when Mr. Apple was asked about it, a lot of the items in question don't show up in those photographs that were attached to that text. There are several items that Mr. Apple, there's tables, there's pots and pans. Those weren't part of the photographs that he sent via text to Scott Edder about, oh, well, these are the items. They were conveniently left off. Same thing whenever he did the inventory of January the 11th. There were items conveniently left off of that as well, some of which, he, within 24 hours, Mr. Apple was back at it with Mr. Gardner removing and taking either to his house or out to his hunting property or in his truck, anywhere but school district property. Seems to me like he's even gone so far as to blame the Pennsylvania School Boards Association now because the policies are so badly written, nobody can understand them, which is just insulting to you and insulting to anybody that actually looks at what the policy said. The fact that Dr. Kovac, who is new here, the fact that Rick Musselman, the fact that uh, Mr. Kinzer, the fact that Mr. Fossey, they were all able to look at policy 617 and say, no, you, we shouldn't do it that way. We, we have to follow the rules with regard to this cash. The testimony was the only Juniata High School didn't have a, a petty cash account showing up to your business office. The testimony was that checks were to be sent to the business office, but cash was to stay on hand at the high school. And then the second part of Mr. Apple's defense seems to be that school laws and policies really don't apply to me anyway. The petty cash policy, which was passed back in 2004, Mr. Apple didn't follow that at all. He was more than willing to let Sabrina Shep take the, the fall for that here this evening. He mentioned her name. Well, once again, who was responsible for the Juniata High School? It wasn't Sabrina Shep. The chief administrator is the fellow that's sitting over there that's facing the statement of charges today. Policies 317 and 417 regarding employee conduct and reporting charges that are filed against you. As was shown, it's so important that there's a notice that's actually posted on the bulletin board that this is what individuals are supposed to do if they're arrested. And the policies are attached to that notice. And there's Act 111 that says within 72 hours, you're to report this. He didn't follow policies 317. He didn't follow policy 417. He didn't follow Act 111. He did what he wanted. 
And it, there's no exception under the law that says, oh, well, in the event that it makes the papers, you don't have to report this. In the event that you think the state police reached out to the school district, you don't have to report this. No, that was a decision that Mr. Apple made on his own. That's not what the law requires of him. And it's certainly not what your policies require of him. And the fact that there is a notice conspicuously posted in Juniata High School, there, there's no way to miss it. <coughs> then, with regard to the, the policy 706.1 for surplus property, the, the fact that he wasn't aware that you needed to have a business office involved in that, that he never looked at that policy. And it's interesting, he said, well, the reason he wasn't worried about that was the superintendent was the one telling him what to do on the 1st and the 12th. Yet, he now wants you to believe that somehow later that day, he stood up to the superintendent and said, oh no, you're not gonna use these as meat tables, I'm gonna take them back to the boosters at some other time. Did he take them back when he had seven adults and a bunch of students there to help? No. When did he take those back? After he found out that there was an investigation into Dr. Yarden. And that was to save his own skin. That wasn't because of any great intention he had to help the boosters. The consumption of alcohol while on the clock. The fact that he needs a policy shown to him to know that that isn't what an educator is supposed to be doing. I won't insult your intelligence by even arguing that. Now look at what he admits. If you look at Exhibit 24, there are a number of admissions. It's correct that a birthday lunch was held at the Red Zone and was paid out of petty cash. <coughs> That's an admission right there by Mr. Apple. He didn't follow your petty cash policy. On June 19th, while well, at the aforementioned birthday lunch, you consumed two bottles of beer and a shot of liquor. Correct. He admits that he was consuming alcohol. The only thing that he's come up with now is, oh, well, that's okay, because it was my time, because I told Sabrina Ship to, to call me off. Well, interestingly, when Ms. Ship was here, she couldn't recall being told that he told her to call off. And the reason she can't recall that is because it didn't happen. He didn't make that instruction. That's like, oh, well, why, why didn't the, uh, the school uh, talk about um, somebody, produce somebody to say that they didn't see him pay cash at the red zone. Well, he's wanting me to prove something that didn't happen. It's impossible. Just like with Sabrina Ship, you know, she was not told that he wanted off, and nobody saw him put money on the table. That's why we didn't produce anybody that said that they saw him put money on the table. He had Mr. Kondo here. He didn't ask Mr. Kondo if he saw him put money on the table, because he didn't. It's yet another lie by Mr. Apple after the fact to try to cover up what he actually did. And I would submit to you that when reviewed, the evidence in its entirety supports the charges of July 22nd of immorality, stealing, lying, drinking on the job. Mr. Musselman didn't just fly back in here. Mr. Musselman still lives in your community and offered testimony that those behaviors by Mr. Apple are not acceptable standards in the community. A willful neglect. He didn't enforce policies. Heck, he didn't even familiarize himself with policies. And he left the job, he didn't report off, and he had a duty as the number two guy in the district. You, you heard him, that was important. I'm the number two guy in the district and it was nice to be recognized finally. As the number two guy in the district, he didn't make anybody aware of what Dr. Yarger was saying he wanted to do with those tables. And he had a fiduciary duty as the number two guy in your district <coughs> to protect school property and make sure that it wasn't being stolen. So if you believe that part of his explanation of all oh, this was all Mr. Gardner, he still failed. He still failed because he had a duty as a high paid administrator in your district, the number two guy, to make sure that the superintendent wasn't pulling those sort of shenanigans. And with regard to his failure to comply with the, the law, and I mean, there are numerous policies he admitted he didn't know existed, and certainly the actions that he described, even during his direct, he didn't comply with your school district policies when it came to petty cash. He didn't comply with your school district policies when it came to what to do with surplus property. He didn't care. He didn't care. 
And so I submit to the board, when you look at the totality of Mr. Apple's actions and Mr. Apple's record, and yes, the public reprimand from 2014 is important because there was a reprimand, there was a five-day suspension, and now you're being asked for termination. This isn't all of a sudden you're getting rid, getting rid of somebody you know, to try to cover up for somebody else or because Scott Edder was embarrassed that somehow he didn't do a proper investigation. No, it's called progressive discipline, and that's what the school district has done with Mr. Apple over the years. And you would be well within your rights and there's certain sufficient evidence and support of the law to terminate Mr. Apple from his appointment with the Juniata County School District. I ask you to please do so. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now concluded with anything that needs to go on the record. I'll just make a brief statement. At this point, I'm going to deliberate with the board. But the board is not going to be returning tonight with any answer. So you're all free to leave. <laughs> don't, don't feel you need to wait around to see what the answer is going to be. I'll, I'll be deliberating with the board and we'll uh, be addressing this in due course at some further, at some further time. And it's my understanding you want the court reporter to take the two witness books? That's correct. All right, if there's nothing further, we'll go off the record. Thank you, uh, witnesses. Thank you, counsel. You each did an excellent job. I want to thank those in attendance for uh, allowing us to proceed and for showing interest. Thank you. Thank you.